is your last meeting today. Because on future Tuesdays you won't have time for a meeting. Um, Zofia wanted me to tell you about uh, this book which I wrote, which is called Being, and which explains in more detail what I've explained so far. You can normally buy it up in the hall, but I think it's run out of copies. So I'll ask the office if they'll put some more copies in the court hall, should you want a copy. And I also wrote this, which is the symbolism of the macabre, which I think is also normally up in the hall. Yeah. And you can also buy it on guest night. And I also wrote this, which is now out of print, but you can still get second-hand copies on Amazon. And that's sort of like this applied to living life. So that's about the life journey. And that's sort of the philosophy of Advaita, put very simply. And in the last few meetings, I tried to put it to you as simply as possible. And we had, the first meeting was on the history of the society and how um, the Mevlo V. Dervish practice fits in within the context of this particular society. And then I attempted to explain non-dualism in the second meeting. And then in the third meeting, I tried to show how the one mind, the one consciousness manifests in time and space, and how all of us fit in as individuals within that picture. And in the fourth meeting, we did the symbolism of the macabre. And then here we are at the last one. And do you have any questions which have arisen out of anything, or your training, or now's a good time to ask them? I, I have one, so it's like, um, I've got two actually. Yeah. It's more connected to... Um, uh, what, how, what we put in, in our body interferes with, um, for how long with the turning, for example, like um, alcohol, uh, uh, because Ellen, when we had the meeting, you know, like mentioned that we shouldn't drink, you know, like, uh, uh, obviously we are not going to, like, uh, have a glass just before the training, but, like, uh, if, like, we have a glass of wine or something, uh, how does that affect on for how long, you know, like the... Uh, like the turning, yeah. even medication, or like things like this. Yeah, you know, like before uh, you turn, um, don't, I wouldn't drink anything. No, 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 the festive season yeah. is coming, no, I'm sure no. some of us are going to have a glass of wine Af or two, after, know, like, uh, after, uh, after the macabre, you can drink yourself silly if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, but like, uh, not, not even on the same day, but for example, if, uh, for how long could that interfere like, uh, uh, with like, the turning, if we have it over the weekend? And yeah, like, no, that, or, or, that you know what I yeah, mean? I know, I know what you're trying to say. Like, uh, what I would say is on... A macabre day, don't drink that day before the macabre. But the night before, Thursday night, you can go down the pub if you want to, whatever it is you do. But it's very individual, we're all so individual that you find what works for you. But us personally, we're not, um, some of you are Muslim, some of you aren't. And in our sort of call it house tradition, we don't have any sort of external rules or do's or don'ts around that. So it's entirely up to you and your tradition. And again, you said about medication. If you're on prescription medication, which you probably already told Helen about, then that's absolutely fine. Doesn't you carry on taking that as your doctor prescribed that. No, no, I'm not, but I was just like wondering, you know, how it can like interfere because like maybe, I don't know. Yeah, like, if like, someone's we probably wouldn't train someone if they were under being prescribed heavy psychotic med anti-psychotic medication but then we wouldn't 
let them on the training anyway because it wouldn't suit them. You have to be fairly mentally stable to be able to embark on this training, mm-hmm. which is why we have quite a rigorous questionnaire, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So there are some conditions, things like um, it's very good for depression. It's very good, particularly for reactive depression, where you've had a big trauma in your life and that's made you really depressed or your life's fallen to pieces. And turning can cut right through that. It's brilliant. I turned um, the day after the worst day of my life and I was, end of the Maccabi, I was just so happy. Mm. I knew I was having a trauma, but it was all going on over there somewhere. And I was just incredibly happy. So it's brilliant for cutting through life's traumas. Yeah, because it's quite powerful, so like even if we are not aware, like whatever we put inside or like, yeah. I'm sure it must be like a yeah. affecting like a Some people, as you get older, I found I drink very little now, it just sort of, alcohol gives you up sometimes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, when I'm feeling really blissful, actually <laughs> drinking brings me down. That's just me personally. Other people drink to get blissful, but um, I find it takes me out of bliss when mm. I drink. Yeah. But I used to love drinking when I was younger. <laughs> and I made lots of homemade wines. <laughs> <laughs> and it got me into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're turning. <laughs> 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 so and uh, so thanks. Uh, and the other question was I think with fasting actually. Uh, how does uh, that um, turning in a fasted state? You know, is it actually? B- and I'm talking maybe eight hours. In yeah. Sort of, how Again, I that, uh, I can't interfere with Muslims because you've got your Ramadan fast. But yeah. as a general rule, you need some food in you before you turn, or your your blood sugar will get really low and your legs will go all wobbly. Mm. So you need, um, if you're a Muslim and it's Ramadan, make sure you eat a lot um, before sunup. Mm. <laughs> so you've got enough enough nutrition in you to keep you keep okay, your body that functioning. Uh, that's a good idea to be like a completely... We had one lady who, she was doing a um, parasite cleanse, wasn't she? And during her training, not a good idea because mm. it just took, she had no energy at all. Mm. Okay. I guess it's individual to everyone, your body, you have to listen to your body. Yeah. I, mean, I went to the gym today before turning and it was not a good idea. No. Because my body was aching, I was like, oh, see, don't do that. Yeah. You've got to listen to your, what your body's telling you. Because yeah. Because everybody's different. Everyone's different. When I was a young artist, I couldn't afford a car, so I used to cycle here about 12 miles from Hampton Court to the Macabre Lane, then turn into Macabre and then cycle 12 miles back again. And when you're very young, you can do that. But later on, (laughs) it's sort of when you pass 40, really, if you want to keep turning, you have to turn pretty regularly, because... you need to keep your stamina up. And we've had turners sort of in their 60s and 70s and they need, they've said they need to do it almost every week or your, your body loses uh, um, the ability to do it, loses the stamina. But when you're young, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you can um, do it and then leave it for a while and then come back to it and there's often no problem. Any more questions? I, I just had a question which was related to the space that you are in when you are actually turning. Yeah. I'm trying to exp- I'm trying to voice it. Yeah. And I'm struggling to explain it because I'm at one point I thought I was in a trance and then I know that I'm fully alert. Yeah. At one point I thought I was dizzy and then yeah. I realised I wasn't dizzy. Yeah. And we were I was talking with Raoul earlier, he was talking about being a bit like a, a vortex or like in mm. the eye of a storm. And then there's there's lots of there's lots of people describing it in well, I see lots of people. How would you describe what zone you go to? Yeah. The zone from um, being in a macabre is you sort of launch out into it, which is brilliant. I adore that bit when the arms drop down, my favourite bit. And then they, they sort of brush the side of your face and they go up. 
that arm almost holds, holds up your pillar. And when you're turning, it's like it's, for me, it's non-stop attention. But particularly in a macabre way, because as Helen would teach you, you give particular space to the person in front of you. So you're really looking after the dervish ahead of you. So you always keep your distance from the dervish who's in front of you. And the dervish who's behind you, they keep their distance from you. And that way, so you're fully aware as you turn, as you're doing all this, lifting your foot and putting it down again and keeping your arms up, you're aware of your spacing and you're aware of everyone around you. So it's just the actual act of turning in the macabre is just solid attention and it's sort of multiple different attentions because there's so many things so there's no room for random thinking so that's why day-to-day -day life again in my big trauma day trauma disappeared because there's just so much to attend to in the ceremony I mean, one of the things that i noticed today for example is at the beginning i was fully aware I had somebody in front of me and somebody behind me. As, a th as it went on, I felt I was losing my, my concept of space and time. Yeah. Both of those things were going out the w window. Yeah. And I felt like I was getting closer to, or I was closer, or then more far away, and then I didn't know where I was. Yeah. In the, again, when you we progress over the next few weeks, particularly when you start moving around the room, first three salams, you're you won't lose yourself at all, you'll be totally present. Because if you're not, you'll fall over or you'll hit the person in front of you, which you probably will do at times, then you'll learn how not to. In the fourth salon, where you go and turn on one pay place, that's where you're turning for yourself. And so you're still aware of who's around you, um, but it's almost in a way you can let go into the movement more because you're no longer having to think of the whole room so much and avoiding people. You still do your best to be aware of who's around you, but you're turning to yourself. So you'll see from experience in the next few weeks how it works. But basically, for me, um, the movement is just attention and more attention. And sometimes in the ceremony, something else comes in and it's like you're being turned, or after the ceremony, there's often there's just this profound stillness, I would describe it as, and from the profound stillness comes this unconditional happiness. Which it's is, like a bliss-like state. It's like a bliss state, yeah. It's intense happiness, but there's no particular reason for your happiness. In normal life, something nice happens, you win the lottery and you get happy. In this, it's just your true nature comes to the fore, and the nature of that true self is unconditional happiness. So you get the bliss state. Very nice. Tanner got it tonight, didn't you, Tanner? I felt it. Well done. Time. The room, I thought the room had a profound, um, I would say, bliss in it tonight. Not everyone may have felt it, but walking around in the middle as I was, I thought, wow, this is got a really lovely atmosphere. That was alright for me, I'm not suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? I love questions. Does um does turning help you like develop in your life? Because um, I already only in the training I already feel that I've um, the courage to let go of things that I haven't been able to in the past and I feel a lot better already so, I mean. yeah I think it dramatically helps um, in your life in your life path and for me as a creative artist it takes you right into the still centre which is where all your creativity emerges from so you turn in the macabre and you come, become very still and then you go off into life with this stillness and whatever your particular role in the life movie is it gets illuminated from within by the in, in the light and that then comes out into your your role in the, in the drama so 
whatever your particular role is, whether you work in an office or you're creating artworks or music, or it becomes... Um, I get thousands almost of people telling me around the world that my designs make them very happy, mm. which I'm happy about because I get very happy painting them. And so it's almost like the sort of happiness spreads. So we talked about the different gunas or qualities and how the guna of being is called sattva, sattva guna. And if you create when you're in a sattvic state, then in my understanding your art becomes imbued with sattva. And that doesn't matter what your particular art is, it could be dance or singing, or even if it's accountancy, you're going to be a, a sattvic accountant. So it's, it imbues your life, your work in the world, your particular role, with a sort of lightness. And that spreads, I think, to answer it. A bit. Yeah, I definitely feel it already. Yeah. Helen, you said you it made turning made you a much happier person. You said, yeah, thank you. Also, I had a difficult. My life was difficult just before I learned to turn, and, um, and my training was very difficult. And um, I just kept turning, and it. The turning helped me touch happiness again, and the difficulties fell away. They just fell away. That sort of goes on to this diagram I did it two or three years ago. It was in the requ uh, request to someone's question, and I was trying to sort of draw a rough diagram of the life journey as I understood it. And there are various different phases, sort of, I've noticed, which I've gone through. And when you're sort of first born, I mean, you get involved in life. And then, at a certain point, as we've already discussed, you're, you sort of turn inwards and you might find a spiritual practice. And so I put practices there. And often you're sort of very sort of earnestly doing your practices. And I call that bombing up the ladder it? <laughs> it's like you're very earnestly working away on yourself and you're bombing up the ladder so I put that the climbing mode and that can go on for a, a number of years in my case I learned to meditate when I was 16 and then I did all things like the gurgi movements and the dervish turning and so you're, you're really sort of going at it hammer and tongs and you are becoming pretty blissful and then, often around the midlife period, you have a big life trauma. It doesn't happen to everyone, but it happens to most people at some point. <laughs> 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 uh, I had mine in my earlier years. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, hopefully you've got it over with it can, it can be a number of things. It can be a, a big illness or a, a divorce or a relationship breakup or any number of things. And at that point, it's like the climbing mode disappears. So you almost go into a sinking mode um, where you're, it's just you let go of everything and everything falls away. And that can go on for an indefinite period. In my case, it went on for about the whole of my 40s, I think. And then after that, it's almost like you emerge, it's like the phoenix rising from the ashes. And um, it's almost like everything's been let go of. So even your knowledge is let go of. Everything, when you're in this phase, you sort of know everything and you're... Um, you can explain anything. You think you don't really listen to anyone else because you already think you've got it all. And then, at this point, all of that disappears. So it's like um, that poem of Robert Blythe, we did not come to remain whole. We came to be like the trees, the trees that are broken, and start again, 
drawing up from the great roots. So that's a wonderful description of her. And after that, it's like you get this rising from the ashes, and there can be this amazing um, creativity seems to come out of the experience you've been through. So the creativity will come to different people in different ways according to your particular talent. And then it goes into what I, that's just my word, for the bliss dance, which is like you dancing on the big step, greater stage of life um, with your expressing your talents. And but all illuminated from this great light within. And there's a brilliant Joseph Campbell bit about that. <clears throat> Joseph Campbell was an American mythologist and he taught at Sarah Lawrence College in, in New York. And if you looked at him, he had this, he had exactly the same expression, which I'd, exactly the same eyes I'd seen on Dr. Rolls, who was my teacher. It's like he had a, a sort of inner smile, is the only way I can put it. And he was asked, do you ever have this sense when you are following your bliss, as I have at moments of being healed, helped by hidden hands and he said all the time it is miraculous I even have a superstition that has grown on me as a result of invisible hands coming all the time namely that if you do follow your bliss you put yourself on a kind of trap that has been there all the while waiting for you and the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. When you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in the field of your bliss and they open the doors to you. I say follow your bliss and don't be afraid and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. I love that, that's totally my experience. If you can manage to make your career out of doing what you most love doing then you get to live a very happy life and the reason I, I sort of particularly love um, the teaching here at Collet is because it's much more based around developing the things you're good at and the things you love rather than there are some teachings, the Gurdjieff one is an example where you have to work on the things you don't like doing. Whereas personally I like working on the things I do like doing. Um, Dr. Rolls said, there is something in each person which is better than it is in anybody else. We have to be true to this, we have to go for self-realization from this, so we have to know ourselves. Each person has a strength or a skill or a beauty, something which has no equal anywhere else. And from this we'll succeed in self-realization. And Shankaracharya, who was our non-dual teacher, you may remember from Northern India in the 60s and 70s. He was the Advaita, head of the Advaita tradition. He said, there is something or other in all of us which is special or outstanding. For example, some are intelligent, some are unintelligent. Some are strong, some are weak. Some are learned, some are ignorant. Some are rich and some are poor. Each should try to please God or serve God or worship God as the case may be with that attribute chiefly in which he excels. This is the path of least resistance. It is sure to work as it has always done in the past. I love that. What could be a better path than mm. developing the things you love? 
Is this with Shankaracharya? That Shankaracharya the last one, yeah. He said that, when did he say that? He said that in 1972. I think turning helps you tune into that. Um, and interestingly, sometimes some, not everybody is meant to turn for the rest of their lives. Some people are only meant to do the training. And that's happened, but sometimes some people come back and they go, oh, as soon as I left, I got married and had a baby, because turning taught me how to fall in love. So people do come back and say things like, it's like, I think the turning training can help me open the door to that. And for some people, like myself, I felt it helped me really fall in love with life and help me access happiness and also I just love to I fell in love with turning itself so some, some of you might fall in love with turning and some of you might not but I think it helps you fall in love with what you're meant to fall in love with You also get an amazing lot of people suddenly get married after <laughs> doing their turning training. Or get training. pregnant. Or get the pregnant. amount of women that have got pregnant after a training is quite phenomenal. Make me want to stop turning. I don't think you are. I don't think you are. I don't think you are. I don't want anyone else to get pregnant. I don't want to get married either. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> it's all right. You need to worry. <laughs> Any more questions? I love questions. Sorry, may I ask where that quote came from? Can I? The, the last one that you. Over Shankaracharya one. From a book? I yes. think it's in my green book. Yeah, it's in my. Oh, this book. Oh, on being. Okay. Thank you. I read through most of the Shankaracharya stuff sort of in the 70s and 80s and then tried to sort of pick out the nuggets. Then I read through all of Rumi and tried to pick out the nuggets. So, although I've written lots of bit, bits myself, I've got a section of quotations after each chapter where I put the nuggets. I quite like, um, with complex teachings, I like to sort of go through them and then pull out the essence of them. Because most teachings underneath are sort of dramatically simple, devastatingly simple. And the Shankaracharya himself says if you go into too much detail, you end up missing the whole thing. So it's best just to really stick with the, the sort of the base set. And you still get some advice to teachers who write massive books. They like some, writing some massive books. Write really yeah, there's a brilliant one by Timothy Freak. I can't remember what it's called, but it's really thin. Mm, Timothy. Hmm. Uh, what's the name? It's called Lucid Living. That's it. Lucid Living. Timothy Freak. Timothy and you can read it in twenty minutes. And that's brilliant. <laughs> I've got my own personal favourite book list. I bet it would be amazing. But it might be different to your personal favourite book list. Yeah. I don't hardly read anything esoteric anymore. Um, I did in my twenties, uh, teens and twenties, I read it, everything I could find on Uspensky and Gurdjieff and Rumi and I read things like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and everything. And then as you go through life, you sort of you sim you assimilate it inside you, and then it all comes out. You sort of regurgitate it very simply. But it all depends just where you are in your life. Some people want masses of knowledge, and that's good. Feed yourself masses of knowledge. Other people just want the bare framework you can get through life with. I've always personally loved 
in relation to spiritual books, I like them best if they're in sort of story form. So I like a good story. Well, at one point I thought I'd never tried to read them at I me. Mean, um, I thought, is, is it worth trying to... I read it through the year before I learnt to turn, so it's when I was about 1920. <coughs> and I used to, it's three, six books, so it's three big volumes. I might have them here somewhere, down there. And I used to get really blissful reading them. And so it's definitely sat there in the words. But um, a lot of it is quite sort of complex. A lot of it's very Islamic, because Rumi was a big fan of the Quran, so he keep quoting the Quran in it. And then he sort of, he starts off a story, and then he sort of deviates and he goes off on a little sort of adventure, and then he carries on the story a sort of a few thousand verses further on. So. Um, if you're desperate for something to read, it's it's a very good read, but uh, it's not an easy read. I used to love Hermann Hesse, who was a author, mm. who did some wonderful because he put it all in story form, mm. like his book, like Siddhartha and the Glass Bead Game, and Narcissus and Goldman. It's really easy to read, and it's very sapphic reading. So I read all of Hermann Hesse. It just just depends. It's, we're all so different and individual. If I like, you might not like. All the Uspensky Gurji things which I read, again in my sort of <coughs> teens and twenties. Now I go back and look at them. They're mostly very dated, and um, so it's almost like before Uspensky got it the right way round. So it's all written from the point of view of consciousness being a very remote an obscure goal. A very academic writer who's very good at the moment is Ken Wilbur, but you really have to have a good head on your shoulders to embark on Ken Wilbur. He's very good, he's very accurate. I think he gets it just right, but he's incredibly academic. So it's almost like reading an academic paper. Of perception, the other one that writer wrote. Oh, Aldous Huxley. Yeah. Brave New World. No, no, there's another one. He did write The Doors of Perception, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. but there was another book that I had, I've not, I've not read it all yet. It was um, exploring all the different sort of spiritual. I may not have read that. Um, not Doors of Perception. The Doors of Perception was based on a quote by William Blake. Oh, okay. No, if it's yeah. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is infinite. Okay. And then the pop group, the doors, base their name on ah, on on that. on that. This book I'm thinking of is <laughs> perennial philosophy. Oh yeah, Aldous perennial Huxley. philosophy. Yeah, I, I would have read it when I was a kid. I think mm. I love that whole idea of a perennial philosophy because mm. it is. It's the same philosophy which keeps popping up in different traditions, in different places. And each time it pops up, it has a different sort of mythology attached to it, mm -hmm. or the metaphors are different. And then in a few generations, the metaphors get hardened into solid <coughs> facts, and everyone forgets that they're just metaphors. So then you get people fight, f go to war over metaphors. That's bad. I like that you said the other week, um, you get a bit lost within a faith if you just go back to the what is it the, um, you know what Jesus used a lot the parables yeah, parab go back to the parables yeah parables are brilliant yeah. as a Christian for you I would recommend the gospel of Thomas I've got that at home actually, yeah. that's pure non-dualism yeah. because it was it was unlike the other gospels it was buried along with the Nag Hammadi scrolls and then it was only dug up in the 1950s. So it's only been translated once, whereas the original Gospels have been translated and rewritten millions of times. So you get the pure teaching, in my opinion, in the Gospel of Thomas. I'll go back and... I must admit, when I did attempt 
attempt to read that. I haven't read it all yet, but I'm yeah. struck by the by the language. It's yeah. completely different to there's a bit in it where um, the disciples said to Jesus when will the kingdom come Mm -hmm. and Jesus said it will not come by looking saying here it is or there it is but rather the kingdom of the father is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it Mm -hmm. so what that's saying in my understanding is it's everything is already consciousness Mm -hmm. it's here already as as it is Mm -hmm. And recognizing that, I suppose, is the kingdom. Yeah. You see it, that yeah. Is the kingdom. yeah. Ken Wilber says, the other world is this world rightly seen. So you're not actually changing anything, you're just seeing everything differently. So the relative world is the absolute? Yeah, absolute and relative are one. Who is it? Um, the gardener says samsara and nirvana are one. They're not two. So, it's a wonderful teaching, but what it's all pointing to is something Ramana Maharshi said. He was a great Indian saint in the first half of the 20th century. And he said, anything you don't have already isn't worth searching for. So it's all about noticing something which is already right here. As in Rumi's analogy of the fish who swam swam up to look for the stuff called water. So it's like there's something which is overlooked. Because a lot of people go off looking for extreme bliss states are great. But bliss states have a beginning and an ending time. So this is all about noticing something which has been there from the very beginning of your journey. And it isn't a changing state, it doesn't come and go. And yet it's, it's always there, and it gets overlooked. So Rumi goes into a lot about not, not pursuing states. States come and go, and Shankaracharya says it a lot too all of these, the play of the different states will happen and there's nothing to choose between them but there's something which is aware of the changing state so when, with, in this bit, the first bit, it's all in my experience about your sort of seeking special states you want to be in this sort of non-dual bliss state in this bit, it's more like you've sank to the bottom, the ground of all being. So it's like, and then you, you notice something which has always been there, which isn't a changing state. So then it's more like you're just living, life isn't about achieving anything, you're just living life, the dance is for the dance. It's not a means to an end, it's just a dance for itself. And that's what the macabre is about. Any more questions? I love questions. Um, I haven't felt like bliss or the trance state but I have felt sadness yeah so what what is that is that in your training yeah and yeah. just in general uh, yeah general uh, life yeah but I don't know where it's coming from yeah have you always felt sadness or is that a recent thing maybe underneath yeah not I mean my persona is very positive I yeah think. so this sadness is just yeah yeah in the turning training in particular, as we've mentioned, it works a bit like a vortex. So, um, experiences from early childhood and subsequent life, we often sort of push them down because um, we don't really want to attend to them too much. So you get lots of stuff gets pushed down and that all goes to build what we call samskara at a previous meeting. 
and in the turning vortex like motion of the turning I don't know how this happens or why it happens but these things often which have been obscuring your happiness at a deeper level bubble up to the surface so it's not unusual in the training for people to experience sadness or unhappiness and don't worry if you don't get bliss for quite a while don't worry about it at all that's just exactly how it should be and it affects everyone completely differently normally what you'll get is you'll get a sort of what I call an incentive bonus which is like you just get a sort of glim you get a glimmer of it just to keep you going (laughs) (laughs) yeah If, if if you never got it at all you might give up so you get the one mind, whoever, whatever you want to call it, Allah or Paramatman or whatever, will give you these little glimpses just to keep you going so you don't get too downhearted. Okay. But don't, don't worry, let all these things emerge. You had a few things emerging in your train, didn't you? I cried a lot. Hmm. A lot of pain came up, a lot of pain, sorrow, sadness. Some, sometimes I, I understand people talk about the, what you were talking about, traumas. Um, I kind of like to visualise it metaphorically as like a air mattress that's been plunged under water. It's slightly connected with also shadow stuff that I've been thinking about recently. Um, you don't really understand often what all these air mattresses are, or what these traumas are, what the pain is all about. And yet when you're going in this process, you don't need to understand. Um, but one of the things that was confusing is that there are circumstances where if you've had deep traumas, you might not even remember them, but you might want to get professional therapy. Mm. So I think I've heard it being said, this is not a replacement for therapy, obviously not. But in some respects, a lot of the releases that you're talking about, similar perhaps in the passion when you when you have like that process of, of like pains and things mm. coming out, Somehow, it's almost like a purification. Mm. Is that is that how you see it? Yeah, it's quite a good analogy. With um, it depends on the level of trauma, and as you say, we do in certain cases recommend psychotherapy, particularly if the person you can have a person who will come in who's deeply traumatized, and they project their trauma out onto the group, and chaos ensues. So in in their case, it's high. You can sometimes you have to stop a person fast turning because it's bringing it up too quickly, and you have to tell them you actually need to go off and have a course of psychotherapy to explore it. With other people, it's just um, everything boils up to the surface, and there's no problem. It just sort of floats away, and that's it. Which is wonderful. Yeah. I guess it's if you. Maybe it happens when certain things haven't been addressed already. Yeah. I suppose it's sort of yeah. I can imagine it would sort of stir up. Yeah. Um, That's why, ideally, letting people on the training, we like people who have had some form of discipline already mm-hmm. or done some work in that department. That's good. But it's quite interesting being you as a teacher. You see a lot of that, don't you? Yeah. And also, um, I mean, you know, I'm watching you very carefully whilst you're turning and learning. So I'm looking at a lot of things. So sometimes I can see maybe a holding pattern or, you know, something needs you need to let go mm. and sometimes it's like what can I 
how can that be facilitated mm -hmm. in order for you to feel safe enough to let go? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I learned to turn, um, something happened, and um, and I did vomit. It's like, and I, I I read you a story quite early on about vomiting the snake mm -hmm. because that happened mm -hmm. to me. It was almost <laughs> something came out. And um, which then, I mean, I cried all the way through the second half of my training. It was like all the grief that I had been carrying yeah. could suddenly just be expressed with no judgment. And it's almost like my, I, I got very soft. Mm. It's like my body became very soft. And, um, you know, and I did at one point just think, oh my God, just get me out of here. This is like, you know. How long is this cooking going to take? I'm boiling here, so I'm pure runny hummus now. Like, when's it going to be over? And there was at some point towards the end where I just fell in love. It's like Felix said, you get an incentive bonus, and something happened. It's like, oh my God, this is absolutely fantastic. And I just carried on, but I remember coming into the changing rooms about one year after learning to turn, and I said to somebody, I don't know what it is, but turning just makes me happy. And she said, you look it. And I thought, did I look unhappy? And, and at some level, I must have done. Because some, somewhere, I let go. Yeah, it wasn't like a, and it's not a mental concept, it's just no. something just fell away. And I talked, I gave you the story of the soul. Mm. You know when I read the story about the soul? And this thing that cleans, it's like you get cleaned, it's almost like you get washed inside out. Mm. And when that happens, in the process of the posture, mm. it's like the light gets poured in. And I'll read something about that. It's like the light gets poured in and it travels out of you. Um, and Philip, I can't remember who the quote was, but I remember reading the same thing. It was about that which gives light must endure burning. That's Victor Frank. Yeah. And I think that's the process of turning is we, we have to burn. Um, yeah. And it's this deep, it's like a deep cleanse happens. And what I let, learned to let go of was my, my own story of my own suffering. Mm. When I let go of that, I just felt free. Turning, turning freed me from my own suffering. Mm. It's like I got beyond my story, which I'd already told to my therapist. Okay, so my therapist knew my story very well because he teased the whole thing out of me. <coughs> and then, I'd done the therapeutic work before I got here, so it was like the turning just <laughs> boiled, yeah. washed. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like you know, just doing the olives in the jar. Like yeah, sort of exercised. It, yeah, ex yeah, totally. Yeah, and and also getting to that moment, I suppose, that point of vulnerability, just just to sort of let go, and surrender. Uh, yeah. And being vulnerable is a brave thing. Oh yeah. So this is sure. if you're gonna do it, guys, I recommend you do it here. Yeah. Yeah, because you get hot held in the process, but it's a, a going into that vulnerable place mm. is extremely liberating. And it's usually, it's like when we talk about our samskaras, it's usually our suffering, our own story of suffering that is the hardest to let go of mm -hmm. because that's part of our we create our identity around it mm -hmm. and when we let go of that story of our own suffering we let go of another layer of identity it's like shedding a skin like a snake letting you let go of that and it's like well when you let go of that identity you can be anything mm -hmm. And that's kind of like when Philip did that diagrams of the four levels about mm. body, psyche. Mm -hmm. It's like that whole thing. So you, you just become that transparent vehicle and you, with no identity. Yeah, that's an interesting point, actually. I never really thought about um, holding on to an identity 
maybe maybe there's a little bit of that that, that I'm holding that thinks it's all been done, if you like. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and maybe I should just let that go and kind of yeah, doesn't matter if there's a residue there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bombing up the land. Bombing up the land. Yeah. 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 It's a bit like shedding skin. Yes. You know, or veils they call it in yeah. in in, in some rumours, it's like the veils of separation. There's another veil of separation. Yeah, but then you've got room from a. Not necessarily. I mean, that's just a circular thing, and it's. it's so you could do that several times. That's just a Philip model, one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 My room's over there. <laughs> I just wanted to say something um, about my, my experience of it is that when I've been in real pain, like when my the nail burnt a hole in my toe, mm. and even tonight my arm was really shaking mm. and I just thought it's going to fall down, mm. that's when I really experienced bliss. So I feel, am I like a masochist? <laughs> 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 like I really... Yeah. There was a real sense of like suddenly I did feel hands holding me up. Yeah. Something like that. It's an interesting observation that in the Gurdjieff movements, which I used to do, there was a movement called the arms out sideways, which the men do. And you have to hold your arms out sideways for quite a long time. And then you start doing, you do marking time with your feet and you raise your head up and down in time. And then someone plays this amazing piece of music on the piano and your attention, your arms are absolutely agony by this time. And all the attention goes from the pain into your heart. It's very amazing. And it's like the pain disappears and this great bliss comes in its place. So I wondered if it's similar to that, that um, in order to get away from the physical pain, you consciously or unconsciously access that part of you which is beyond pain so I think that's a sort of byproduct of, of the turning movement but almost it, the, the pain of the movement and it is a very difficult movement and it carries on being a tough movement it doesn't it never becomes a doddle does it it's always going to demand the whole of you to do it but that's the very thing that seems to, for some reason, access the great stillness and happiness behind it. So that's a good example, thanks. Any more questions? I was wondering if that could apply to spiritual pain as well because it's physical you know um, sometimes pain can make us act in very negative ways or very hateful ways or but you know I wasn't very wondering if that kind of you know when you're doing it physically you can apply that to when you're going through pain mm -hmm. in your life that you can just let it go through you and not be reactive. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about pain making you, you can act, make you act in hateful ways, especially psychological pain. Because when you're blissfully happy, you're never nasty to people. You're always loving and nice to them. But when you're deeply unhappy or disturbed, that's when you're unpleasant to other people. And that helps gives you compassion when people behave like that because you know it's coming from an unhappy person. Our sort of job, Helen and my job within this process is to help you access the great stillness which is your true nature, which is beyond all trauma. So that's sort of our job, isn't it? Ultimately. Pain. pain would be unavoidable, but suffering is optional. Yeah. Not to suffer your suffering. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's some people's identity. They are a victim. And they, they make that their life's identity and they endlessly tell that s story to anybody who will listen. That was Eckhart Tolle's concept of the pain body, yeah. which is your identity with suffering. Yeah. And it's very hard to get people off their suffering yeah. in that case, yeah. because they suddenly think, well, if I give up that, what am I? Yeah. We've had one or two of them. Yeah, we have. Any more? I was going to ask Ken, what uh, the passage of this today what, with the tone, the book, what, what was the book that you were reading? It was a really interesting, sound like it would be a good book to read. It was bought for me as a present. I'm just wondering if there's a copy here or if I gave it away. I was given a copy of, I think it was called, called Women, Women Called to the Path of Rooming. Here it is. And um, this book, I believe, uh, there's a, is it Loras? Jalaluddin Loras. Jalaluddin Loras was um, a dervish who went to America and set up the Medlevy Order of America. And um, so there's quite a few people. It's, I think it's set around the Medlevy Order of America and him teaching there and a lot, so there's quite a lot of women, but that story actually came out of this book. Okay. okay. When did women first turn? Well, Mr. Rizui taught women here. Mm. But did they turn before that? In Turkey. In Turkey. Uh, no. Not together, no. I don't think. I think no. they did separately. No. Um, I know Lois taught women in America, but I know some. I think it was earliest my teacher who told me that Mr. Rizui taught women here when he first came in '63, and I don't think they were too happy in Istanbul. And Mr. Rizui's response to that was, "Well, don't women cry?" And actually, if I think about it, um, I'm really grateful to Mr. Rizui. Yeah. And I think Mr. Rizui had, um, what was the word? Um, he was radical. Yeah, and he had it foresight and uh, yeah. we're Mr. Rizui's legacy. And I'll always be grateful for that. They obviously, uh, Jaladud in Loras also taught women in America. And there's different groups in America, but that's quite a nice book as well. Jaladud in Loras, his dad was the Sheikh of Khan, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And he sent his son to America. Mm. And um, we do have various dialogues with people from America. We do, we've got good you? friends yeah. from Mev Levy of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That round? Any more? I've got nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want uh, the previous diagram of the, the box. movement from physical to psychic? Yeah. Is that here anyway? It's, um... On the other side. Okay, that's fine, yeah. I'm just going to... That on my you can photograph that one. Yeah, if not, it's all mostly in the green book. Oh, okay. I came to that diagram. Originally, it was a version Uspensky had done, but different. And um, the week after Dr. Rolls died, I stayed in his big house down in Twickenham, where he lived, and I slept in a bed there. And it was my birthday. And when I wake up, woke up in the next morning, it felt like I'd this great knowledge had come from somewhere. And I saw it as a visual symbol. It was like this huge great orb of light I could see. 
and on top of it were these tatty bits of fabric and if you got in the way of one of the tatty bits of fabric it was possible to obscure all the light which was coming out of this huge orb and so I realised that the orb of light was what you are it is possible to identify with just a small bit of the covering and, and miss your whole identity so I saw that, it was like a visual symbol I don't know how I saw it it was like within an inner eye but I felt myself that that was a sort of birthday gift from Dr. Rolls a week after he died and from that I sort of developed the whole, whole of that so that's like the great light there and that's just the covering and the covering in the re relation to the light barely had any existence but yet it was possible to identify with it and miss the point of what you are and you are the great light so that was how it happened anyone else? You can all go home then. <laughs> <laughs> and next week your training hots up, doesn't it? So, so it, this is a this is the, the turning. It seems to me it's it's an. I mean, you can do these journeys many times. And you, yeah. And so it takes different phases, and yeah, you might have another trauma boom. You might have several traumas. Right. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> When you're 85, you might get put in an old people's home and have another children. Yeah. But you, it's like you're sort of thinking from letting go to letting go. So you go on letting go and handing over. And that happens in the macabre way. You'll keep letting go and letting go. And then you have, what was it you called it? The, the something Salam, the terrible one. Oh, the killer macabre, the killer. yeah. <laughs> that was one called Penchko, which is the one I learned to. It's very long. And we christened it the killer macabre. <laughs> we might not let you turn to the killer macabre. <laughs> we want it. You want that? <laughs> Well. We want the pain. We <laughs> <laughs> like to suffer. <laughs> There's an even longer one. I think Hazam's longer than the killer. Helen, did we do a salam today? Like the, did we do the whole thing? We did all four. Oh. Four salams. Four salams. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Really? You did all four salams today. You didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have your arms up the whole time because you, you had sticks sometimes. But right. you, yeah, you yeah, did yeah. the whole half hour <laughs> turning music. Wow. Sometimes that feels like five hours, and sometimes it feels like two minutes. You cut through time. I was impressed. I must say, wandering around looking at you all and thinking, "Wow, they've done a whole macabre." Eh? And tomorrow night, so Friday night, Macabre is in honour of George Masri, Georgie Bay, as I call him. So if any of you, some of you are on the door, any others of you are welcome to come into the robing room when, when we robe before the ceremony. He yeah, returned um, in, in through just when George died. Oh, he was very peaceful. that's nice. I'm sure he was there. And am I right in thinking that there's another turning that we can't believe the following? Yeah, the following one is Shebi Arras, okay. which celebrates Rumi's wedding night with the beloved. So that's normally a special party. So that's, we got Guess Macabre this Friday for Georgie Bay, and then Shebi Arras the following Friday for Rumi and Georgie Bay. This ends in bay, why is it? Um, it's a name I gave him because there's a bit in the Samus and Brash's prayer which sounds like Georgie Bay to Lao Rao. And that's it. So I started calling him Georgie Bay. 
sound when like the youngsters these days because they call their Bay. Bay. Bay is a Tur- Bay is a Turkish title, I think. Oh, yes. He he called me Philip Pasha, and I called him Georgie Bay. <laughs> I've got a question about the speed. Speed. Should we, when we are turning, should we move to the beat? You don't have to. Okay. Um, Helen might correct me, but you can go at any speed you want to. And when you're learning, and Helen will do this to you, you often get, you have to, when you've got your robe on, you need to go fast enough to get your robe out. And so that's step one, is getting your robe out. Helen will whirl you, she'll get your arm and whirl you, and out comes the robe, and that holds you. Later on, Helen might slow you down. So, but you don't, you can turn in time with the music, but it's not, you don't have to. So you can turn um, iris- any speed irrespective of the beat of the music, but the music will sort of hold and support you. But you'll see in the third salon the music speeds up halfway through, and often as the shake I'll indicate a music player to up the volume in the ceremony because that again helps support the turners who are starting to get tired, it carries them. Yeah, I found myself turning very fast. <laughs> yeah, you can. It's good to turn fast, especially in the early stages of your training, isn't it? Because it gets your, it'll get your skirt out. Because at the moment, a lot of you, you've all been practicing on the nail, so you sort of take one step, and you almost have a little rest, and then you take another <laughs> step. But eventually, it becomes a continuous movement, and then you get the person. You suddenly see, wow, that person's flying. They suddenly. They get it and off they go. And it's no longer a, like a one movement and another movement. It's just a continuous flow. And to do that, you need to get some speed up. I never know actually how fast I'm going rap. No. And I suddenly, suddenly thought, I'm probably going really, really slowly. But actually, I feel like I'm going really slowly. <laughs> You're about normal, I think. You do get some turners who go really go do it hell for leather, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> you have to be fairly young to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you can get old here. Oh, then you got one from Mexico, um, Ignacio. Ignacio, who does the whole thing beautifully in slow motion yeah. almost. Yeah. I don't know how he does it. Oh. But he does the whole ceremony in slow motion. But for me, I found you sort of needed, you need a certain amount of momentum. If you're a big fellow like me, you need to sort of, the momentum sort of keeps you whirling, get the speed up, and then it just sort of carries you. Okay, we can all go home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.